Hi everyone, we're in conversation today with Tim Cranmore, um, an English recorder maker who you may know. Um, and so just diving in with our first question for Tim. Uh, Tim, what got you into making recorders? Well, strangely, I tried to make a recorder at school. I can't remember why, but I know that all my brothers and sisters have got recorders that they knew in primary school and I hadn't. And I actually tried to make one in the woodworking shop. And then when I went down to be a biochemist, I had recorder lessons at Guildhall School of Music. And when the biochemistry went horribly wrong, my recorder teacher, he went out and got a little drunk and I said, I don't know what to do. And he said, why don't you make recorders? The world needs recorders. And so within about a week, I went from a laboratory at Guy's Hospital to a converted chicken shed in Oxfordshire trying to work out how to make a hole down a piece of wood. Um, and I wish someone had told me at the time that Fred Morgan was giving recorder making lessons over in The Hague, but no one told me that. So I sat down and worked it out myself. And it's taken a long time, but you know, I think I'll get there now. It's only sort of 40 years later. <laughs> um, uh, we spoke uh, the other day and, and you said you'd made over 40 different types of recorders. Uh, over those 40 years. Is that is that right? Well, the thing is, there are so many different sort of fiddle flute things. Um, I suppose the most, the oddest one I've made is a copy of the little flagellet in the museum in Basel, which is about this long, which is for teaching birds how to sing. And then recently I made a copy of the Mary Rose uh, bass three-hole pipe, which is quite a bit bigger, which was brought up when they bought the, bought the Mary Rose up and they'd never seen one before except in pictures. And I'd made three whole pipes because people buy them. When I was very young, we were all making Renaissance consorts. So I have even made a Renaissance consort down to low F based on the Vienna instruments. Unfortunately, it's in A460, which no one wants, but it's very ornamental in the corner of the workshop. And yes, when I added up, you have sopranino, six flute, soprano, altos in S, altos in G, French pitch, Baroque pitch, modern pitch, Renaissance pitch, you want medieval recorders, Renaissance recorders, you can just go on and on. It does mean that life is not is really boring. And in the lockdown, I've done two completely new things. I made a dinner base and I've made a medieval seat tenor because I thought, well, that's a couple that I haven't tried before. So I couldn't really tell you how much the list is up to now. All I will say is that if anyone actually wants to make a list of them after I've gone, then they're going to have some problems. <laughs> Sounds like a lot. And then obviously for, for those of, uh, people who have not necessarily in the record world, they might have seen you play or having made uh, your carrot recorders. Uh, with the London Vegetable Orchestra as well. Yes, well, 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 well that was um, a friend of mine who was doing a little uh, organic country festival somewhere, rang me up and said, have you made a recorder out of a carrot? There's a man in Japan who does it and there's film of him on YouTube. And I said, yes, of course I can, um, without really knowing whether I could at all. Um, and so I turned up in a little town called Lemster and played an improvised concerto for two carrot recorders that only had three notes and percussion. And that was filmed and went on YouTube. And then the well-known maker, Potato Crisps, rang me up and said, do you want to be in an advert? Um, and so the long and short of it is that I ended up down in London in a very strange film studio with six students from the Royal Academy who didn't know what was going on. And by looking at the, just dropping names here, the Vienna Vegetable Orchestra website, we put together a, an orchestra and we played um, a few bars of Soul Bossa Nova, if you know where to find that video, it's still on YouTube. And then we got calls from the BBC and we were on Room 101 and Russell Howard's Good News and all these sort of things. And so it took off from there. And yeah, th th that's been, fun. I mean, before Christmas, we were out in Abu Dhabi 
uh, playing Christmas carols on the seafront, strangely. And um, we actually had invitations from a fair few Middle Eastern countries after that, but unfortunately, uh, the virus got in the way. So I don't know what's going to happen if that's going to resurrect itself when everything comes down. Well, hopefully, hopefully it will do. Um, maybe, maybe next year now, though, I guess. Um, but back to you, sort of more traditional recorders. Um, and so one of your recent uh, sort of designs and models is the Dragon Flute, um, which, uh, which we've, we've got in the, the early music shop. Um, and we've got in soprano and alto, uh, both with pickups and not with pickups. Um, but uh, what, what kind of started you on making those? <coughs> well, once again, many years ago, I went to my children's primary school and I had a lovely little trio there and I taught them to play consort recorder and I kept them going until they were about 13 or 14 and they went to the school concert in the local church, it was packed, they played Bach, they played the African suite, they were fantastic, they got a standing ovation, I was extraordinarily proud of them and they all came to me the next week and said, I'm sorry sir, we've got to quit. I said, oh? Why have you got to quit? Because everyone at school is laughing at us because we play a recorder. And I never saw them again. So I started thinking, okay, how can you create a recorder that everyone will not laugh at when they see you playing it? Because unfortunately, nowadays, that does tend to happen. Um, so I thought, well, it's got to be an instrument that doesn't look like a recorder, definitely has a contemporary feel. And if some big bloke with tattoos and a Mohican in a medieval early music band wants to play on a stage in front of 10,000 headbanging goths, he would be able to hold up this instrument and think, I am proud of this instrument. This is my instrument. Don't I look cool with this instrument? So that was the idea. The, the idea was to make a recorder that people would use in the rock and pop world without feeling they had to apologize for playing a recorder, or at least looking as though they played a recorder, because as we know, image is everything nowadays, and when the camera is zooming on your face, you don't necessarily want to be seen with, with a, a well-known plastic maker school recorder in your mouth. So I fiddled around with some shapes, I thought, well, it's got to be black because that's goth. We got pagan, we got pagan folk, goth, rock, the aforementioned heavy metal early music, which if you haven't looked up, look it up. It's great fun. And um, I'd also recently started playing the saxophone, so I was getting into this whole sort of world. So I thought, okay, it's got to be black, it's got to be spiky, it's got to be edgy. People have got to look at this and not think, oh, it's a recorder. They have to ask, what's that? So I came up with this shape. And um, I've got a couple down here. Here you go, can you see that? I can, yes. Yeah. So this is a dragon flute. It's got a dragon on. Um, dragons were suggested by yourself. Um, because when I first made them, I thought, well, put something on the front and I went to the local jewelry goth jewellery stall and bought sort of scorpions and snakes and things and stuck them on the front. But dragons is good. Dragons is Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, this sort of thing. It's a contemporary style. It's got a big bore. I don't know if you can see that. Um, as you said, it's got this pickup in the side, which you can connect through, through to the sound system. But for someone maybe like I said, the aforementioned tall bloke with tattoos, lots of oil and a Mohican who plays on the stage in front of 10,000 head banging goths and who might not have touched a recorder since he was at school, but rather fancied one as part of a, the texture of a song. This works just with ordinary fingering, top to bottom, no extra keys, no real problems, very easily. And so I'm not expecting people to pick it up and play concertos on it but I would like the idea of some very serious heavy metal people playing it on stage, just even if they only play half a dozen notes through a massive sound system. 
I think um, that was the idea. And I thought, well, if every one of their fans wants one, and if we make a plastic version, then yeah, we're made. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, there's the, the, um, especially in sort of Eastern Europe and, and Germany and places, uh, especially Italy yep. as well, um, they've got an absolutely massive medieval heavy metal kind of crossover following. Oh, oh yes. I mean, if, if you look, I won't men mention the names of bands, but if you look it up, they are big. They play six foot tall sets of bagpipes with chains and spikes on them. And they have chariots coming on stage and cowed chanting monks and but they are very full on and if the camera goes around for the audience you think okay there's an awful lot of possible punters out there um so recorder playing and techniques have obviously changed so much over the years um and you've mentioned sort of the renaissance consort that's that sat in your workshop and obviously we've kind of moved through renaissance baroque um and obviously, I guess that's, that's changed the demand for your instruments. But what's what's been the sort of your kind of your biggest seller, as it were, the, the one that is, is most in demand from your experience as a maker? Well, it, it, it comes and goes. Um, many, many years ago, I remember turning up at the Recorder Festival in Stockstadt, opening my suitcase and it was empty about two hours later. Um, I thought, wow, this is amazing. Um, next year, of course, it happened to someone else. The, 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 the recorder world is very fashion driven. And nowadays, there are a lot of young makers who've sprung up over the last few years. They're young, they're sexy, they're pushy, they're, they're very internet savvy. Um, and I was talking to someone from Europe and he said, well, the, the players really are interested to be seen to be playing recorders by a certain maker. So when I started up, it was Fred Morgan, of course. And um, for years in England, it was Von Huner, because the teachers used to say, well, we tell all our pupils to buy Von Huner low pitch dinner, because then they know if they turn up at a gig to play with someone else, you'll all have, have, have the same instrument, which is largely why I went to Europe and I did very well in Europe. And one of the first ones I did well with was good old voice flute. You can see that? Yes. Kind of voice flute. And I like to think, I think I was probably one of the first makers that actually made Denner voice flutes that worked. All I know is that one year I sold about 25 of them. Wow, that's quite a lot of voice flute. Mm -hmm. And I'm always coming across people who've got them and saying, oh, I've had one of your voice flutes for a long time. Nowadays, I'm lucky if I sell one a year because everyone makes good voice flutes. It's, it's, it's not just me, because we are commercial. There's a lot of competition. Um, if you're not competitive, you just don't survive in the recorder market. There's no point in a way making wonderful things that work. You've, you've got to be out there competing, which is why we go to European festivals and all line up on our stalls and sell more or less the same stuff at the same price. And that's why I've had very little business this year because all those festivals up until the end of September have been canceled. And it's fine for me because I'm a pensioner, but I know that the other recorder makers are really, really panicking about what's going to happen next. Yeah, it's certainly a worrying time for lots of self-employed people, which obviously most of the recorder makers are. Um, and then in terms of recorder making in England, I mean, obviously we have had previous sort of uh, English makers apart from yourself, um, but for sort of years and years, particularly for sort of, I think, my kind of uh, lifetime uh, in terms of playing the recorder, you have been the, the, the only English recorder maker. And obviously we've got a few, few sort of upcoming makers now in England. So what do you think the future of English recorder making uh, looks like? Is it looking bright or... Well, it's interesting that, that you say I, I was the only one because once again, a little while ago, I made a list and I think there are 12 recorder makers in England who were going at, at the same time as me. Um, and they've now, they either, some of them have died, some of them have retired, some of them um, gave up, 
but they all had one thing in common, really. They were really quite shy and retiring people. And if you mention the idea of filling a suitcase full of recorders and going off to Europe, you could see that, that they just panicked. And I, I only survived because that's what I did right from the beginning. I packed my suitcase and I went off, off to Europe. Recently, I've been, as you probably know, running, running recorder making courses over in Cambridge um, and, also, and also in, in my workshop. And um, of the people who've been through, most of them are elderly people who are not going to do it for a living, but there have been a few young ones. And we do, in fact, have three people working in this country now. Am I allowed to mention names? Of course, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, well, you've probably come across Jack Garak, yeah? Yes. Who is, who is putting himself full on as a, as a recorder maker. Um, now, there's also Julie Dean and Anthony Barrett. And they're, I, I know they would like to make recorders, but um, they need to make that, that giant leap, so to speak, into believing in themselves as recorder players. If you're watching this, you too. <laughs> um, but also, we have the Continental Makers. And obviously, I've been going over to Europe to sell. And in London, the German, French, and Italian makers, they come over here to sell. So you can't think, well, I'm the English maker, I'm the only one in England, therefore I'm going to get all the work. It's a completely competitive market, and there are, I think, 10 or 12 young European makers who've started up in the last couple of years, a couple of whom have been through my course, and they are all going to be very good at it. So any English recorder maker is going to have to compete in Europe. So heaven only knows what... I hate to mention the word, but I'm going to say it. Brexit is going to do to our trade. And everyone's a little bit panicky about it. Um, and then back to your recorder making. Um, in terms of sort of different woods, um, what's your favourite wood to, to, to work with? Everyone would expect me to say boxwood, I expect. Boxwood is a complete pain. Um, it's quite expensive. You hardly get anything out of a tree. It's quite wasteful. I've got a shed full of boxwood with bits of holes down it um, <clears throat> that I have to leave for years before I can use it. And even then, the recorder might bend. Um, if you want to make something in a hurry, then maple is a good choice. And there's nothing wrong with maple. Um, it's interesting that no one wants to buy rosewood recorders nowadays because I understand they are associated with makers from the mid 20th century where an awful lot of rosewood was used not particularly well. Um, now, Blackwood recently, uh, Blackwood was inadvertently included in a society's ban. So we were not going to be allowed to use it anymore. And of course, all the makers of orchestral clarinets and oboes went completely mad and said, well, hang on a minute, we don't want to have to buy a CITES certificate to improve where our wood came from, because we know it comes from sustainable sources. And so uh, they were persuaded to remove Blackwood from the endangered register, which is good. So that's, that's a little hiatus. But now it means that I can get lots of Blackwood. Blackwood is good stuff. Um, it makes a great sound. The only problem with it is that it's black. And so it's actually quite difficult to work because it's quite difficult to see what you're looking at. Even when you've got really, well, you've got really bright lights on it, it just, it, it just reflects. So boxwood, I mean, this is, no, actually, I haven't got a single boxwood recorder here. Now, both of these recorders are made out of stained maple. I think they're really pretty. They're lovely recorders. They're light. Um, I see no sign of them of, of, of them wearing out. But of course, once again, maple is associated with with rather cheap cheap recorders. This is a 
a maple medieval C10 that I made a couple of weeks ago, just out of interest. Maple is good. I get it from my local timber merchants, who like the people who make kitchen kitchen surfaces. And um, if it goes wrong, you can just throw it away and start again. So what's my favourite wood? It entirely depends what direction I'm coming from. If I want to make something quickly, I'll make something out of maple. If I want to make something that's going to be quite loud and look cool and um, once again, I can just pick it up and make it out of African blackwood. If I want to make something that I know I can turn up at a show with and have on the stand and people will buy it, then I make the instruments out of boxwood because boxwood is firmly lodged in people's heads. And of course, obviously, a lot of the historical instruments were made out of boxwood, so it's, it's authentic and it's great. It's just a bit of a pain. <laughs> um, and in terms of your models, um, what has been the most challenging model or, or recorder that, that you've made? And is, is the one that you want, you just like that is the one that I'd, I'd want to sort of absolutely get right? The most challenging things to make are Baroque Sopraninos. They are impossible. Everyone wants a Baroque Sopranino to play a certain set of Vivaldi concertos. Um, I don't think there's a surviving instrument from that time from Italy that you could point to and say, someone might correct me here, you can point to and say that's what those concertos were played on. But nevertheless, everyone wants a low pitch Baroque Sopranino to play the Vivaldi concertos that can be heard over an orchestra. And at the moment, it's not easy to get one. I made one that really, really worked. And that was great. It was made out of mammoth ivory. And I sold that to a very good player in Germany. And I know that she plays a lot of Vivaldi concertos on it. But I've tried making a 415 Brox Sopranino since. And they are very, very hit and miss. You might get, you might make two and two won't work. Maybe you'll make two and one will work. Or, well, at the moment, I've just given up. So 415 Baroque Sopranino is an absolute nightmare. <laughs> what exciting sort of new developments have you also been up to recently? One of the most interesting things I did recently is that um, I made a base three-hole pipe according to the Pretorius drawing, which no one had ever done before. In fact, the Mary Rose three-hole pipe, only I think one other person had, had done it before. So I made a base three-hole pipe, and a few weeks ago, the Tabor Society got together in Gloucester Cathedral with a consort of three-hole pipes and played Pretorius on it. And I was really pleased about that. And they were all very academic lots, and they said, we really don't think that anyone has played Pretorius on a consort of three-hole pipes anywhere in the world since the 17th century until now. So that was a really nice thing to do. I, I made a complete Bretan consort at the original pitch with single holes, which comes out at about A405. And last year at the London show, a consort played this Bresson consort from bass up to fourth flute, including bass, tenor fourth flute, uh, C tenor, F alto, and soprano fourth flute, which I think showed that for English consort music, at least the fourth flute is a very good instrument to play the top line. So that was a first, because I don't think that had happened for hundreds of years. So there are lots of surviving recorders uh, all across the world. Um, so we've got, well, there's one in Warwickshire. Uh, we've got the one at the, the Bresson at the Bates Collection. Um, what's been the most interesting original you've been able to sort of study and play? Well, the, the nicest ones I played were the ones in Vienna, which um, there are. There are a lot of recorders in the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, nearly all of them in storage now. Um, Adrian Brown has written a very good book. And many, many, many years ago, I went skiing 
and thought, well, I'm in Austria, so Vienna can't be that far away before I knew anything about maps and we didn't have Google Maps. So I just went to the station and said in appalling German, return ticket to Vienna, please. And when I got there 12 hours later, I managed to talk my way into the, in the instrument department and started to measure the very, very big bases, uh, which was a phenomenal thing to do until the director turned up and gave me a right plea in the year about being there in the first place and then gave his assistant a real German dressing down, very loud, which I heard down the corridor about how dare he let me in when he had expressly forbidden anyone to measure the recorders. However, never mind, that was that. Um, when I was starting to make, I was very lucky because the curator up at Warwick County Museum, you mentioned Warwick, they have three very nice English originals there. One alto by Stainsby Jr. Uh, one alto which has center and foot by Stainsby Sr. and a head by Bressan. And a bass which could be by Stainsby, it's not stamped, but it's exactly the same pattern as, as the Bressan basses. And I was just allowed to go up there and sit at a table and do anything I liked with these recorders. And that's fantastic. Um, about the only place you can sort of do that now is down in Oxford and with the Bay Collection. And in fact, I had a very, very interesting time a couple of years ago because we went down with Peter Holtschlag to Southampton University. And Peter had several copies of the Bressan Alto, including one made by me and the original. And he went and sat in the anechoic chamber of Southampton University and played exactly the same scale and piece on, I think, four different altos, the original and three copies. Um, and they put the original in their CAT scanner and did some fantastic pictures exactly showing the inside of the recorder in a way that you could never normally have seen. And I'm not sure what happened to the results. I know there was a bit of a fight over intellectual property. I don't know if that's been sorted out now. But that, once again, was, was very interesting. And the Bait Collection then let Peter Holtzlug have the Bressan for six months. And he made a very wonderful CD with it. Well, thanks, Tim, uh, for chatting to us today um, from what looks like sunny Morven. Um, uh, it's been it's been great to to find out more about you and your making and uh, and the recorder. Um, so thank you. Thank you for having me.